so we were presented with a bit of a challenge in putting together this panel. Um, the theme under which we were originally organized was urban. Um, and my work, while it does um, end up in the New York Harbor, um, in the sections of the Hudson that run past um, Manhattan and the Bronx, um, it is uh, kind of more of a general survey of the entire region. Uh, the Hudson begins, um, uh, originates at Mount Marcy, which is the highest peak in New York State. Uh, you can see it up there. Uh, like very far north and not urban at all. Um, so it would have been a little, um, a little bit of a reduction to kind of remain under that umbrella um, as it runs through the course of New York State. Um, so we kind of reorganized based on the themes of all of our work, uh, which I'll let Brian Rooney tell you about his. So I'm Brian Rooney. Um, I am also a senior poetry major at Lang. Uh, and I, my work is a part of my capstone as well. And it is a poetic take on city planning, uh, specifically Robert Moses and the Cross Bronx Expressway in the South Bronx. Um, I came to this project because I've been reading a lot on city planning, Robert Caro's book, Power Broker, uh, Jane Jacobs to Life and Death of American Cities. And I realized growing up in Long Island that a lot of the surrounding areas were kind of put there by Robert Moses and kind of not done in the most ethical way. So the entire capstone is a somewhat of a reflective piece on how surroundings affect us and how they were put there ethically or not. Hi, my name is Charles Franchino. Uh, I study in the sociology department at Lang, uh, part of the new school. Um, the core of my presentation is the extracurricular work I've been doing for the last year around the growing problem of homelessness in Newark, New Jersey, and how the community has gone about reacting to the issue. Um, teaming up with my colleagues here who both work with literature uh, has been a really great experience and it's really helped me grow my ability to create a narrative, which is something that's completely invaluable for someone who usually approaches their work more analytically uh, as a sociologist. Um, so yeah. So um, one of the kind of binding themes that we came to as you uh, see reflected in the title of this presentation now, Sides of the River, um, is obviously proximity. Um, like the, the work that we're all doing is really geographically in interaction with each other, mine running directly through essentially um, where uh, Brian's work takes place as, as well as um, Charles is. And um, part of it also is about people responding to place. Um, the way that we interact with our landscapes, the way that our landscapes are shaped by us, um, I think that's what we're all partly concerned with at least, and it's a, it's a common thread that runs through all of our work. Um, so we're going to be pre presenting some of our work uh, kind of through that context. Um, so I'm going to read uh, first um, a poem uh, from my senior capstone that kind of surveys the entire, uh, the entire uh, run of the Hudson River. Watershed. Lake tier of the clouds, a name with the sound of a droplet like clouds put down one perfect globe of water, clear, round, blue, and said, let there be river, and so it rolled. A map maker's standard set of clean and untouchable cold, where husks of broken conifers stand, brittle sentinels around the shore. The clouds once cried for a river to a glacier's highest footprint in the state's highest peak, and so it rolled. A blink to send a rivulet sliding 50 miles past the feet of pines and cedars, insisting its shape into the mountain until rocks gave way. Indian Pass Brook meets calamity, where opalescent, is no, opalescent River is no longer opalescent but Hudson, a cobweb's lace of blue lines running nameless through the great maps of New York State, always new in confluence named for a man who never made it this far north. And so it rolls. Everybody's Hudson, in Wilton and Corinth, its smooth, flat spaces in the forest banks of etym ancient metamorphic rock, and people who swim in August wince at first step in the water when the cold meniscus seals hydrogen bond close against their bare bellies. When their toes sink in silt, float beer cans, but in little acts of nervous worship, always take the empties home. Swimmers, rope swingers, plunge like all that tumbles from the steep-hilled woods, swirl into the organic murk of fresh water above the blind curve that hides the precipice of the falls. 
Heritage contaminants long seeped in sediment now will be dredged for 40 miles south. Hands of cranes will grapple at a toxicity biomagnified in the spawns and filter feeds of a near century. Two little factories in stone on the edge of a waterfall. Two types of GE machine. Two million yards of river bottom where the amber oil of PCBs settled in tons for decades. What is left of price shopper plastic bags, beer cans, of effluvia of transformers and capacitators gathered in Troy? Buoys against the concrete shoulder of the federal dam, water spilling in steps, dull chartreuse of brine meets aerochlor. Sand bottom, no toes dug in, no bellies but those too cold to brace, those that float with all else left. The ocean comes here, a surging up creep of salt as if to say, I will not bury what you left me. So runoff sewage soda bottles have climbed the length of half the state to toss against the dam from southward to. And so both ways it rolls. Towns and towns sprout from the east and west banks, nestled in the highlands, walking trails sent as emissaries to meet the storm king to stand at wind gate. Every five miles, a waterfront park, a lookout point, out spider main streets and broadways into the green of the lower valley and station roads that run in curves to railroad tracks like tributaries, schooling with commuters, taxpayers who test for runoff, swim for charity, swim for cancer, the water is now, we are told, in most places, PCB-free enough, hazardous only half the time. Around the base of the Tappan Zee, suburban children make their third grade pilgrimage single file, trudge along the tide line in rain boots filling glass vials with gray water, freeing six pack rings from muck, small hands taught small ways to care for a sickness in the spine of your homeland just beyond the sight line of where river meets sea. Moment upon moment, they have met. Meet now with every molecule, oxygen turned into a new tide, fresh water kneaded into salt. Will meet for every instant the body of land can no longer hold banks to keep it fine and close, estuarine, but break islands and fall its floor into a plummeting harbor. What was never sifted gathers. The upper bay and underworld before mica dinettes, strip cars, rats and shipwrecks, oil sinking in plumes. Lower Bay keeps lobster, rosefish, bass, and mussels clinging to the legs of its piers, gives the nudging tide all that was not shed down in a cloud tier. Up with the salt and sewage, up with the sludge of the city, up with beads of rainbow and clouded plastic, and the estuary spreads swirling to knock against the dam at Troy as if to say, I will not bury what you left me. In the early 1900s, Robert Moses' mother, Bella, would often travel downtown to the Lower East Side to work for the Madison House. The Lower East Side was made up of Russian Jews, and Bella Moses, Moses was a German Jew. She would travel down there from the Upper East Side and attempt to civilize the Russian Jews. The Madison House, House's official history claims that it was established to help in the Americanization of the Lower East Side. Bella believed that the Russian Jews would ruin the reputation of the Jew German Jews. Therefore, she worked to groom them and teach them English. Jews who made enough money in the 20s and 30s moved out of the Lower East Side. Some moved to Central Park West. Others moved to East Tremont. East Tremont was a small neighborhood in the Bronx just above Cretona Park. Robert Moses, in 1952, pushed a plan to remove 54 apartment buildings in East Tremont to make way for the Cross Bronx Expressway. The families in these apartment buildings were the former Lower East Side Russian descended Jews that Bella Moses thought were uncivilized. But there were also families that came from the Caribbean, the South, and South America. Moses could have moved his road to Cretona Park, which would have only destroyed six buildings, but he refused to negotiate. Why did Robert Moses feel it necessary to destroy the homes of 1,500 people, family? Who knows? December 4th, 1952. Dear resident, your building is being condemned by the city and will be torn down. You have 90 days to move. Sincerely, Robert Moses, City Construction Coordinator. Dear Robert Moses, my name is Lillian Edelstein. I am 39 years old and a Jewish housewife living in East Tremont in the Bronx. 
I am a resident of 867 East 176th Street. The ground opened up underneath my feet when you sent me your letter. I had heard about these plans as soft gossip, but I never believed that it could come true. My husband's $75 weekly salary as a hat blocker was enough to pay the $56 rent and basic living expenses each month. We could still afford to live comfortably in a neighborhood full of Jewish families that shared our culture, language, and experiences. You will deprive us all of this dream without any consideration for all the lives that you hold in your hands. We heard about this plan, but we thought it would run through Katona Park. What happened to that plan? I walk through these streets with your letter in my hand, and I look into the bakeries, butcher shops, and brownstones. I see the faces of their inhabitants. There is a vegetable stand in Cortona Avenue that has lived there ever since this area looked like farmland. How dare you take this community from us? We will not go easily. We will fight for this neighborhood. Sincerely, Lillian Edelstein. Naturally, when any community is faced with an issue, it can respond in any number of ways. Many different people know the city of Newark as many things. Newark is New Jersey's most populous city, located adjacent to the Newark Bay and just a few miles west of the Hudson. For the modern professional, Newark is one of the top up-and-coming business and tech hubs on the East Coast. With incredible, incredible proximity and transportation options to New York City and cheaper development opportunities. Someone who may be from the area, but not Newark directly, will tell you to run as far as you can. Newark has an overwhelming history of poverty, violence, and general meanness. According to Condé Nast Traveler, <laughs> for multiple years in a row, Newark, New Jersey was rated the meanest city in the United States. But to a resident, Newark is a home that's being taken away by an influx of new industry. And considering the city's poor economic climate, the citizens have nowhere to go but down, often leaving their homes. The city of Newark has seen an average rate of homelessness growth around 4% a year, while the state as an entirety has experienced a decrease in homelessness, more specifically a decrease of 14% just last year. The problem for Newark is getting worse, and the community had to respond, and the community had to search for resolutions for this specific problem. The community that responded to the homeless issue hasn't come from just churches and nonprofits with people with college degrees. The response, response which I speak of came from the homeless themselves. Now, six months ago, I was working as an employment counselor with a nonprofit in Newark where I met a man named Prentice, whom I was co facilitating a focus group with. At the time, he was on the management board of the nonprofit I was working for. He was of large, commanding presence with the most incredible voice that spoke words of wisdom, which he learned from being homeless on the streets of Newark for 20 years, most of which he spent working full-time at a government agency. During his tenure of homelessness and employment, he spent many of his nights sleeping in the bushes behind the very office he was waking up to go to work to. We spoke about the community, how it's growing and how to solve it. We concluded that though the work of these religious groups nonprofits and governmental organizations is very necessary. It's not what the people need to lift themselves out of their situations. To lift themselves out of homelessness, it was just keeping them comfortable in their poverty. And what the people needed was inspiration. And being comfortable in your poverty is a weird idea, especially in today's political climate. But when we use this phrase, what we mean is this. Clothing, food, temporary shelters, cash allowances, these are all important things necessary to survive. We all know that but that's all that those things do. They only allow you to survive. Those services don't help individuals pull themselves out of their situation. There's nothing inspiring about those things. So Prentice and I continued to meet and discuss the homeless community. And this led us to formally register the Cool School LLC, or Center of Occupational Learning, as a means of inspiration within the community. We just weren't quite sure how yet. And at the time, I had a client named Roscoe. Roscoe was my very first client and was coming in regularly for employment meetings. We made his resume a few times over, and that's totally underselling how many times. <laughs> we worked on his computer skills, interview skills, and we applied to jobs and jobs and jobs and jobs and jobs and jobs and, jobs and never got a bite. Roscoe was not a particularly difficult client to work with or help, but his situation as a homeless individual was equally as bad as anyone else's, which made him difficult to employ. His garb was unflattering, and he was painfully shy. 
Prior to my meeting with him, I was told how much potential he had, but I wasn't quite seeing it there. Mr. Prentice and I had met a number of times in the office space that we were given, and we reached out to community members through word of mouth. We'd be there talking about the cool school, and slowly we had a following of homeless individuals interested in what we had to offer. Their main draw for coming to our meetings was that they realized there was an opportunity for them to say what they wanted to say. But not only that, but they had a chance to talk about the problem, how they saw it, and how they thought it should be fixed. They wanted their voice heard, and for homeless individuals, that comes very rarely. And it was surreal at first to see all these individuals come together. Uh, we realized we needed someone who was with them, because neither Mr. Prentice or myself were homeless. Uh, we needed someone who was one of them, and we needed someone who was reliable and had potential, but the most important part was that we needed someone that was in the street. Apartment burial. <clears throat> the expressway sits and watches. Mouth open wide, iron teeth protrude and jut. It watches people move out. People of East Vermont cram furniture through small hallways down dark stairways. When the families are done, a swarm of demolition teams will hack and pick out the insides of brick. Workers will mallet hammers into walls, not just any plasterboard, cement. Walls that hung photos of family, knock out shelves that held heirlooms, looming memorials of a dead culture. The workers split the wood of the cabinet that kept porcelain plates stained with soot and crusted over mildew. Legged bathtubs will crumble in the bathrooms. Living rooms where families held celebrations will cave in. Ear-shattering bulldozers come through and destroy. Giant wreckers thud into the walls and build hills of rubble. Mammoth cranes dig the piles out, create an empty lot to continue the rising road. Steel for brick. Drivers will move through the future one-mile strip. They'll ride to their suburban homes. Moses called these buildings slums. He'll build his road through 1,500 families. The pile of rubble will be stuffed underground into a hill dump of Merrick or Freeport. Generations will live in those hills. So uh, quick context, the South Bronx, once uh, all the original families move out, um, it becomes the place where hip hop is uh, formed in the late 70s, early 80s. So Grandmaster Flash of the Furious Five um, formed there. And this is a persona poem from MC Melly Mel, who is the uh, person who sung all of the songs like The Message, which is their most famous song. MC Melly Mel clears the air. 1979, the South Bronx. Can you hear the silence? Whites moved out, but these Caribbean, African, Hispanics have nowhere to go. We emigrated here. Flash came from Barbados. This neighborhood is all we can afford. The Tremont people to the north above Cortona Park are gone. The streets unattended are littered with broken glass. Rodents and roaches run through our piss-puddled hallways. Kids drop out of high school to become pimps and pushers, unemployed, pickpocket and panhandle. What are we to do? The stylus drags on the LP waiting to be flipped. All that can be heard is the crackle of dust and grooves being projected over our busted amps. Soot hover, hovers over the lot and travels down into our lungs. It's hard to breathe. We clear our throats, we prepare a verse. Don't push me because I'm close to the edge. I'm trying not to lose my head. So Prentice and I met with Roscoe. We asked him how he felt about the idea of being president of the organization, basically being in charge. And he agreed to do it, but he seemed hesitant and really insecure. I will say I wasn't sure if it was the best move. He was going to have to lead meetings, get us consistent information, be incredibly reliable, and that is a lot to ask of someone that's part of this community. In addition to that, Roscoe, like many homeless individuals, already had a great deal on his plate, but there was nothing more important to him than finding employment. As his employment counselor, and someone that has invested a great deal of time into him and truly believed in him, it was my concern as well. So our next meeting came, and Roscoe seemed different. He didn't speak or do much, but he seemed a bit more upbeat. 
At this point in time, Roscoe had stopped coming to our employment sessions and was now just going to cool school meetings, which was a cause for concern because finding employment was the main priority. At the next cool school meeting, things were different. In a room that should barely have more than five people were more than a dozen homeless individuals. At the table was Roscoe sitting calmly. In front of Roscoe was a stack of five or six books high, all on leadership techniques, with bookmarks and page folds more than a quarter deep into each book. Roscoe stood up and he took charge of the meeting. Roscoe took more command and displayed more confidence until there was a day where his transformation was obvious. He came in with new clothes, very clean, a stack of books in hand, and glowing with confidence. I was proud because his tra transformation was clear, but to my knowledge, he still didn't have a job, which was my original point of association with him. He closed out our meeting, something he had gotten used to doing as part of his routine as president of the organization. And after I called him over and I approached him, and asked, quite frankly, why have you stopped coming to our meetings? And he looked at me and said with a proud, cheerful, and confident grin, I got a job. Now, the cool school has a lot of purposes. It wants to be a consultation company by the homeless for the homeless. It wants to be an organization that makes changes through initiatives, like registering the homeless to vote. So they see that they have a very strong political voice, and one that needs to be heard. It wants to create an art collective so that the homeless can embrace their artistic skills and express themselves. It wants to set up an urban garden for the homeless to gain new skills and benefit from proper nutrition being available. But most of all, the cool school wants to be a vehicle for hope in the homeless community. And who better to respond to the homeless phenomenon than the homeless themselves? I'm going to close out um, with uh, two more poems that are uh, located uh, much farther down than uh, my last ones. Um, as you can see where the red dot is, it's uh, like directly across the river um, from the, the point that Charles was doing. 11.34 so we'll p.m. on a Thursday at Pier 40. Then the lamps go out. All those bright beacons do not sputter, but are sucked into negation, though I can feel the great drag and shift of my water body, even when I can't see it, feel the hiss and murmur under the cacophony of returning geese, and so will not need to gasp and gather belongings from the benches and scatter like a mouse from a kitchen light or a man startled up by a blackout before his sight can even capture muted versions of everything that was before. What borders are said to be of state, of borough, city, are made now only by the fact of this side of water or the other. All that is, is metal vanished by darkness and glass made solid by light reflected or glass made liquid by light from within. The world is this, darkness, light, and its reflection, black, white, chrome. Under a skin of shifting onyx, what moves, moves in secret swims, siphons, burrows into gravel. Above, helicopters drift like lowlers pulled on the line of some sightless course in wide circles with nothing left to give chase in the big empty. The scent is all and only gasoline. At the reignition of street lamps, all beings, grass blades, and sidewalks turn to color from night gray shades, but Hudson clouding to impenetrable smoke courts. Love note. A river is a festive body at 21,400 cubic feet per second. Here at her second widest swell, the Hudson is not the clean blue tear she once was, but a green dance of salt and sediment. Turn on your light in the evening, in the winter, in the house on top of the hills borne with her by the Triassic shudder of the earth. Cleave that vital spine between these low and gentle shoulder blades. She will take your pink sun and shadow and cut them to confetti thrown south. When the leaves fall to open the horizon, the hill, the house, and you will stand all on tiptoes, leaning off the balcony to see her floating barges of oil, grain, and gypsum on the broad back, rippling with wave and tide as if to shake off a fly. For years, I have written love notes to the banks and beaches, rock bass, and rose pagonias of this river, and still cannot translate the word of her open, rushing mouth. But turn off your light, 
in the attic in the early dark and watch her take the lights of your bridges, your stars and cities, catch them like the bright tips of mat matchsticks and carry them away. Thank you. Well, if we're good on time, um, we have... Uh, it's four Okay, uh, so we've got some time for a uh, question and answer if anybody has any questions. I, did, I wanted to ask about the way that you, about the way you structured the panel was so extraordinary and I just was wondering how that evolved, if you have any comments or if it, and it changed your work in any ways to kind of be thinking about how to make these presentations work together. Um, that was the thing we actually decided on pretty early on. I think it was our first meeting. Um, we decided um, we wanted it to be more of a kind of a mutual presentation um, rather than, um, I don't know, just our separate works to kind of allow it to be an entity to itself um, and not just like a, a reference to the work that we're doing outside of this room. Um, so, I mean, my work, I, I wouldn't say it changed, but I did, um, I did focus a little more time on the like my, my capstone is still in, in process. I'm not gonna be done with it for another month about, but I'm going to um, be spending more time now after this panel on the, the work focusing on upstate because I, I really wanted to to be in geographic proximity to the work um, that they're doing. So I was spending more time on my kind of downstate, downstate poems. Yeah, very similar. Um, a lot my geography also spans various locations, so uh, I kind of chose the things that were more related to this area that was on the river so that we could kind of have this geography, like thematic ge geography. Yeah, I, I felt like I got kind of lucky uh, working with these two. <laughs> um, yeah, they really uh, kept it together for me a lot of the time, um, and especially kind of finding a way to emphasize, uh, you know, kind of the Hudson being the midpoint of all of our work. Um, once we kind of like came to that that realization, it was a lot easier from there. So that affected my work in the sense that instead of focusing on Newark in and of itself, I kind of had to focus on Newark and its relationship, um, you know, to the water surrounding it and the other you know communities, much like the South Bronx that brought in smoke clouds. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. I, and it's, it's just lovely to think about this is a place and a place for water, people, homelessness, social issues. I'm so curious two poets, um, who are some of your favorite poets, whether they did want you or you're, you're different. But I am, I love to find out about the people who are reading. And um, Charles, I'd love to know sociologists you find in the poem. There are a lot of really Sociologists, who have become public figures, interest role as you think about the sense of people have been presented and white people have been presented. I was curious who you read, who you think are important, who you should all be reading, whether it's poets, sociologists. Um, so, uh, as far as sociologists, um, my sociologist that I, I feel like I've gotten a lot of influence from is someone who's at this school, and that's Terry Williams. Um, he's absolutely brilliant. He's, he's written, he's in the process of writing a book on homelessness and um, a lot of kind of uh, urban conditions and things like that. So that's something I found uh, very compelling. But I think as far as truly understanding the homeless condition, it's hard to find you know a sociologist and say, this, this person gets it. Um, it's something that that has to be experienced, um, you know, as a whole, not through perhaps a book or just uh, you know an outside source like that. It's something you have to see kind of with your own eyes and, and be in it yourself. So uh, I don't necessarily know of uh, individual sociologists that would help you kind of understand uh, the plight of it. But as far as where I come from, I think Terry Williams does a really good job. And he's brilliant himself. So yeah. You uh, so, 
there's a lot of people. First off, Robert Caro, he's not a poet, but he wrote the book, Power Broker, which is amazing. And in the uh, book, he's, uh, even though it's like a biography, it has a lot of images and beautiful descriptions. Uh, in terms of poets, Hart Crane, you know, and a lot of the modernist poets, in the, uh, the, they're very interested in the urban. Hart Crane is poem of the bridge. It's helpful for a lot of like infrastructure type imagery. Uh, Adrian Matika is a new poem, newer poet. And he wrote two collections. One of them is called Mixology, and it's, I would call it hip hop poetry. Uh, there's like, it's so good. Um, and then the baby in smoke, he writes a lot of persona poems in that. So those two works were very important. And a lot of other poetry, so many. Um, the the poets that I'm focusing on, and this is like part of part of the capstone, is thinking critically about um, kind of where your work falls in a lineage of poets who are doing similar things, um, or who you have learned things from. And like, it seems to me that there, it, the work that I'm doing kind of falls into lineages to a degree that of like landscape poetry and and poetry particularly that comes from um, like the landscape of one's coming of age, uh, which is what this is for me. I've lived on the Hudson my entire life in one place or another, kind of just like bouncing up and down. <laughs> um, and then the other being research-based poems um, that like kind of focus outside the self. Um, some of my work now has become kind of turned more internal, turned to the personal, but the one of the foundations of this project was that it was going to be, it was going to be like rigorously research-based that I've been like reading just um, like geo geological surveys of the Hudson River, like benthic mapping of like what the, what the, what the riverbed is made of at like different points um, along the Hudson, like how, like how the riverbed was formed, where is based on glacial movements, where is it based on uh, tectonic plates. Um, so a lot of my reading has been just like scientific survey, um, but then it's also been really important to me to read um, the works of poets who to kind of take up this task, but in a different different content, um, different subject, people who are really committed to integrating research um, into their poetry. Um, uh, Tracy K. Smith was one of my, um, the people who like uh, kind of started this for me in my mind of life, life on Mars, like her like really incredible integration of, of science and history with, with kind of personal, um, personal narrative and um, uh, Carolyn Forche, also really important, um, even to kind of, I think to a lesser degree, uh, Maggie Nelson, um, because I don't know, kind of the, the structure of her work makes it, I think, a little bit, it's more it's more prosaic, so I think it's easier to kind of fit that in than when you're trying to, a lot of what I'm doing ends up being kind of like turning fact into image, turning data into image. Um, and then just kind of like, I don't know, Elizabeth Bishop is like, like lives in my blood. <laughs> um, so I think she's always part of it. <laughs> writing this, um, there's some persona poetry in here, and I was very worried about slipping into caricature, I guess, because you know, you go too far trying to embody some sort of voice, it can just come off poorly. And so I wanted to give justice to the voices that I was taking on, and I think like that is something that I really had to think about. But also like just taking on social projects in general, yeah, that's like you know, they're important, so and I feel like you should take on projects that are have some sort of weight to them, I guess. Like the the place that this came out of for me was not one of like like oh I have to change something, but just kind of like a natural fixation or obsession. I just kept writing poems about the Hudson, so I started writing uh, poems about the Hudson. But I think um, when I decided to do it from from the angle of research, it became really important to me. Um, to do it in an honest way and in a way that's not like 
like landscape poetry is like concerned with beauty and it is concerned um, with kind of glorifying the natural world, but this is also in a context of industry um, of like post-industrial upstate New York, which is, um, uh, yeah, has had a like complex and at times problematic relationship with the river. Um, a lot of my other poems have a focus kind of more um, closely on pollution and the effects of pollution. And it's, um, I don't like, I don't, I don't like know what effect these this work is going to have in the world, if any. Um, but it felt important to me um, in the ethics of my own work um, to be accurate, to be rigorous, to not, um, if I'm going to dedicate myself to writing about this, um, I want to do it in a way that um, is is responsible and like is not um, what you would see by just riding a train um, like down the one side of the Hudson um, for an hour, but uh, knowing like really intimately having knowledge of what is happening in these ecosystems, um, like how we are affecting them and how they are affecting us. Brian was talking about your set of poems, his second part of your storytelling. I want to talk a little bit about the ways in which you think about representing the voices of the homeless when you are presenting uh, the, the, the cool <laughs> <laughs> um, could you kind of clarify a little bit? Well, I was just thinking about Brian's statement you know, that you know, he's concerned about capturing the voice of other people and capturing their personas and their poetry. And I know that you and I have had a couple of conversations about talking about people, the people that you work with, the ways in which you kind of ethical questions and, and, and you know, responsibility questions or social responsibility questions that you have when you want to talk about. Do you want to go into that? So this is actually something I, I question a lot with myself, kind of with academia and kind of urban issues in general is kind of treating them like a spectacle. Um, is, you know, you can go into this homeless situation and observe it and then write a book about it, but then what kind of have, have you gotten from that or what, what difference have you made? Um, so I think any time I'm trying to do research or I'm trying to, um, you know, come up, come up with a conclusion or think of new questions, I, I really try to, I, I don't know, I really don't want to treat these individuals who mean so much to me as kind of just, you know, people at a circus for people to look at and read about, and then that's the extent of it. And further than that, um, kind of just using people's, you know, real names uh, is something that's also I, I go back and forth with because um, in one sense, giving this person this identity and giving an identity to a homeless individual is necessary because we all need to know that these are real people that are, you know, suffering from this condition. So creating a fake name or an alias kind of takes away from that a little bit. Um, and I think that's kind of a really powerful necessity that I kind of go back and forth with as far as ethically because you don't want to just you know, perhaps if it's something that they are ashamed of, you wouldn't want to kind of put them out there like that. So it's, it's really a balancing act depending on the situation. So. Can I ask us a related question? I was just really curious. So this, the, what you presented today was about work you've done, right? So yes. volunteer work, work you've done in the community, not your academic work per se. Does your academic work touch on homelessness or do you try to keep those two pieces? So I mean, how do, how do those intersect? Um, my professors at this point are very likely sick of my work because it is all <laughs> thing. I try to take every single assignment and focus it around homelessness to the best of my ability um, because it means so much to me and I think when you do that um, it gives you an opportunity to look at this situation differently. Um, so yeah, for just about every uh, term paper, research paper I've had to do, unless it was a more specific topic, I do my absolute best to tie it into homelessness. So yeah, it's it's very heavily influential in my academic work. Thank you guys for coming.